The Crystal Palace accounts cover the year to the 30th of June 2017. They were due to be submitted to Company's House by the 31st of March 2018, but were a few months late. Clubs split income into three categories match day, broadcasting, and commercial. Palace's match day income fell 11% in 2017 to £10.6 million. This initially appears odd as attendances rose. The fall is due to two Wembley appearances in the FA Cup the previous season and the cap on away fan ticket prices in 2016-17 at £30. Palace have more matchday income than many provincial teams due to being able to charge London prices, but less than those with bigger stadiums and regular European home games. In terms of broadcasting income, Palace were major beneficiaries of the new domestic TV deal with an increase of 50%. This was combined with the club appearing on TV four times more than the previous season, worth about £1 million per appearance, and £2 million for prize money in finishing one place higher in the league table too. A lot of clubs in the Premier League are very dependent upon broadcast income, and Palace are no exception, with nearly £5 in every six coming from this source. There are mutterings from fans of many clubs that TV money ruins the game, but there is an argument to say that it makes the Premier League more competitive. Successfully being able to outbid most clubs in Europe for players has allowed clubs of the stature of Palace to recruit the likes of Johan Gabay and keep players like Wilfred Zaha. A rise in commercial income of 28% is impressive. Although both the shirt sponsor and manufacturer were the same as the previous season, the club may have signed deals on the back of the previous season's FA Cup run or earned bonuses that kicked in on the back of this. An additional source of income for Palace in 2016-17 was £4 million of other income. In the accounts, this is described as compensation for, award in favour of the club by the Premier League manager's arbitration tribunal. This would appear to be the money Palace received when former manager Tony Pulis tried to stiff the club by taking a £2.5 million bonus for keeping them up in 2013-14 before leaving. Pulis was, however, only entitled to the bonus if still at the club on the 31st of August, but he asked for it to be paid early and then resigned on the 14th of August. Palace sued for the bonus to be repaid, and Pulis and the case went to tribunal. Palace's main costs were in relation to players, and the wage bill rose by 39% to nearly £112 million, close to six times the amount they paid out when promoted from the championship in 2013. Having a wage bill rising at this rate does look alarming. Normally, wages rise substantially when a club is either promoted or there is a new Premier League TV deal commencing. This would explain the jumps in 2014 and 2017, but in between too there have been significant increases in wage costs as the club has invested in new players and keeping some existing ones. A wage bill of this magnitude puts Palace almost neck and neck with Leicester, who had won the Premier League the previous season and had the benefit of Champions League participation too. It's difficult to see the rationale behind Palace's wage rise compared to that of many other clubs. The three promoted clubs are self-explanatory, City had to fund Guardiola's spending spree, and Leicester had new contracts having won the Premier League. Chelsea's wage bill fell despite winning the Premier League because of the lack of Champions League participation. Premier League wages overall rose by only £135 million, as the clubs promoted had lower totals than those they replaced. Representing £78.30 of cost for every £100 of income in 2016-17, wages at Palace are proportionally the highest of any Premier League club. This suggests that both Alan Pardew and Sam Allardyce were backed during the season. It does, however, limit the wriggle room to increase wages in future years unless they generate extra income, hence the proposal to expand Selhurst. Because of the boost in staff costs, Palace players have an average weekly wage of over £50,000 per week. One of the directors also had a substantial pay rise. Only one director appears to be on the payroll, and the likely recipient is Steve Parrish. There's nothing wrong with Parrish earning such a sum. He's been a contributor to the club being promoted and securing a position in the Premier League. The sum earned is broadly in line with the average income for a first-team player. The accounts do appear very defensive in relation to this money, though. First, there is a note in the director's report stating that a bonus the previous season had been foregone and then implied that the bonus and more had been reinvested in the club. In addition to the salary earned, Steve Parrish controlled companies that sold services to Palace. VMM Limited appears to be a property company with one employee and Smoke and Mirrors Group Limited, by all accounts, rents a property in Soho to Palace, which seems a bit odd, as does tripling the rent for 2016-17. Profit is income, less costs, but it contains lots of layers and estimated figures. Palace's profit and loss account refers to a few different profits, so they need a little bit of explanation. Operating profit is income, less all the running costs of the club, except loan interest and tax. 
On the face of things, it looks as if Palace have had a good year in 2016-17 with an improvement of nearly £19 million. Included in operating profits are some volatile income and costs such as profit on players sold. Palace made profits on player sales of £35 million. If non-recurring items like these are removed, we get something called EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, which in theory is a sustainable, recurring profit figure. Palace's EBIT profits are less impressive, as the profit becomes a loss reflecting the increase in wages and other operating costs in the year. The Premier League made EBIT profits of £147 million in 2016-17, but these vary substantially from club to club, and Palace had the third highest EBIT loss. If non-cash costs such as amortisation and depreciation are removed, then another profit figure called EBITDA, earnings before income tax, depreciation and amortisation, is created. This is liked by professional analysts as it is the nearest thing to a cash profit figure. The good news for Palace is that they made an EBITDA profit. The bad news is that it was the second lowest in the division. The Premier League made EBITDA profits of £1,183 million, of which just £10 million was earned by Palace. Palace splashed the cash in 2016-17, with over £104 million spent on players such as Benteke, Townsend, Milivojevic and Van Aanhal, making them the fourth highest gross spenders in the division. The large spend on players is why the amortisation charge of the profit and loss account is so high. Fans will rightly point out that clubs also sell players and that net spend is a better measure of a club's investment in talent. Taking this into account, Palace spent over £65 million net in 1617 and shows the extent of the achievement in 2013 being promoted with a negative net spend. Palace once again came fourth in the Premier League in terms of net spend. So how can we summarise Palace's accounts? Well, ultimately, Premier League membership is the most critical element of income generation and here the club has been successful, so the directors would argue that the policy has worked. Some questions remain, such as the sources of funding for stadium expansion, but these are capable of being overcome, provided that there are not significant interest costs on any loans. As for the delay in sending in the accounts, well, there seems to be little justification. 